a great pleasure to be part of the uh, Dyer Poetry Series. And thank you so much, Timothy, for inviting me. And, uh, and uh, it's a good chance to um, read from my new book, Lovers in the Free Fall, published by Leapfrog Press in Fredonia, uh, New York. And that was the press that um, Marge Piercy and uh, Ira Wood started. So yeah. ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dire Literary Series. This is, this is easy for me. We'll just let uh, Eliz run the whole show, which will be awesome. So uh, <laughs> welcome to the Dire Literary Series. And our, our special guest is from Lynn, Massachusetts, formerly from Brookline, Massachusetts, Elizabeth Gordon McKim. Yeah. Let's see. The host has spotlighted you ready. Okay, so I'm ready to roll. Okay, so... Um, reading a few poems from the book, Lovers in the Free Fall. The first one uh, is called Watch, being a watcher, watch. In the cusp of loving, I skim lonely in precise places near your home. I watch you from upside the head, from waterbed, from book of the dead, from gibbous to full moon, from cow jump over the salty spoon, from telephone call, from Duluth, from empty booth, from broken tooth, from two roads on the earth, both taken from two tongues shaken, from bring home the beacon, from Easter, from Ramadan, from Pesach, from birth, from the mirror, from mirth, from thunder, from the bridge, from the air, from water, from fire, from the muck and mire, from what we share, from our local quicksilver lair, from when you look at me, from when I look at you, from when look at you, from when you look at me, from the door, from when we go home, we go home together, two together, two together, gather roses, roses, two together, gather roses, roses, washed in the blood, washed in the blood of the ordinary life. Okay. So <clears throat> moving on to the second section of the book, and I'm going to read a poem uh, that is uh, half in French and half in English. So I do the translation, the bridge between the two languages. And this actually was a dream poem. I woke up and I had the dream. <laughs> Sorry, my eyes are watering for some reason. <clears throat> La lune et le trottoir, the moon and the sidewalk. Mais qu'est-ce qu'il y a? Hey, what's going on? La lune est sur le trottoir, the moon is on the sidewalk, et le trottoir brille, and the sidewalk is shining. Mais écoute, chérie, but listen, sweetheart. La lune ne coûte rien, the moon costs nothing, Et le trottoir and the sidewalk, tout, 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 ce que, ce que, ce que, tu es, tu es, tu es. All, 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 all that you are. Ça alors, laisse la tranquille. Hey, give me a break. Je t'en prie, I'm begging you. Regarde, chérie. Hey, look, sweetheart. Le trottoir se respire maintenant. The sidewalk is breathing into itself. Secret, passionant. Secret, passionate. Et la lune and the moon. La lune est dure et inflexible. The moon is tough. The moon will not give in. Okay, so uh, next session, uh, next, okay, um, stories are very much an uh, important part of me as a poet. Song, stories, and poems, oral tradition. This one is called Fish for Etheridge Knight. 
When you first arrived at Indiana State Penitentiary in Michigan City, that's what you were, fish. You had that fresh fish smell. You had that fresh fish look. And you had to watch your fresh fish back. And when the others came up from Pendleton, no longer juveniles, they were young militant blacks and you watched and rejoiced. That's what they were, fish, but a new and dangerous breed, voicing revolution. By that time you were in love with fish. You had your own tank in your cell and you fell in love with fish. In the beginning you had the tank for the light so you could read your way deep into the night and sink solitary and reckless into Fanon and Malcolm and A.J. Rogers and Haki, Langston and Sonia and Gwen and Dudley, Bly and Louis Untermeyer's anthology of modern poetry. The title said so slowly and deliberately you could taste the syllables and later you fell in love with the fish. You liked to watch them swirl and glide. And sometimes when you were casting out of the pen and angling for a flip tail swish of a thought, you would open up your prison vision to the fish. And you knew you were in love, in love with the scent and the ink, in love with the fish nosing their way up against the common glass. Okay, uh, let's see now. All right, uh, have a few more minutes. Nor'easter. Well, it's a st been a stormy day today, so maybe this is a good one. Nor'easter. Coltrane on the radio, love supreme, sheets of sound, warm inside, outside snow coming down, relentless hush puppy ghosts, while the workers strike, while the soldiers forge and surge, while the movie plays at the circle theater, while my greatest pleasure is to stay in bed a long time, a tomb of time, an inside outside time, a rhyme of home veering toward, ghosting off, an investigation in the bones, a tree mending notion, a tremendous tree mending rooted in the sift and silt of things, in the unkind tune of kingdoms, in the the unwise manner of wise men in the woman grown to grown women on the road growing toward lands and years and beginning my mother spinning while the blood flows the lost blood the insomnia of the old years the release of the mama the sloughing off toward peace the best beginning careening on a roll flood out of control watch out for the llama watch out for the pheasant watch out for the seemingly pleasant diversion watch out for the trauma snow coming up again and again round the corner circulating its particular notion its genetic swirl while family grows smaller and friends more real, all this continuation in the enduring world, all this crazy rhyme and elation, all this desolation and jubilation. Got a notion, I've been rowing in your ocean. Go slow now, go slow, go slow now. Say I've been snowing in your nation all this time, all this crazy rhyme and rune all this crazy tune and time say i've been knowing in your nation all this time all this crazy roll of time and one more okay is that all right okay one more uh this is the title poem of the book lovers in the free fall when i first came here I found my future free falling out of a blank sky, no moon, oblivion covering me like a tarp, till still slumbering and somehow lapsed, 
I slap down, wised up, slap down, wised up, slap down, wised up to the plausible earth. Rising up too late for my rescue, revealing our true impartial partnership like an open map like a well-used trap. Lovers, lovers, lovers in a free fall, lovers in a free fall, lovers in a free fall now. Lovers, lovers, lovers in a free fall, lovers in a free fall, lovers in a free fall now. Okay. Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. And I just want you to know that we're bombarded with questions here. So uh, maybe we can run through a bunch of them fairly quickly so that we can get around to all of them. They're all really, really good questions. Okay. Um, I hope I can answer a few of them. Oh, they're, they're good ones. So no? uh, it's very obvious you use sound and repetition in your work, and it's very musical. Why do you think that you relate so much to that? Well, that's a very good question. I, I think that I started to love words when I, when I you know, was a child. And it was a th little things like lullabies and jump rope songs and things that had repetitions and even prayers and things like that that had this rhythm and pulse. You know, and the rhythm and pulse connected to the words was something that um, just drew me into uh, poetry. And uh, so I've always connected uh, with that, um, you know, the, the I think that I am a poet that really is kind of living in that, in the rhythm of uh, music and poetry. Yeah. Yeah. So what about the rhythm and the music? Do you listen to music when you write? Uh, do, or do you have melodies in your head when you're writing or neither of those? Well, yeah, that's a good. Another good question. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a mutterer and an utterer, and also I love um, movement. That was really again a very important part of my uh, study as a poet. Was I worked with a dancer, and a, she was a dance therapist, and did all this wonderful work with movement. Uh, her name uh, is Norma Canner, and she was really my mentor and she helped me to realize that my sounds uh, were connect connected to music, even like pre-verbal sounds, so sounds under the substructure of language. There were always these sounds. And she helped me to, um, I had sort of like repressed all that in a way, like put that down. You know, uh, I wasn't really affirmed in the sense that I was really a poet of sounding. And so it was with Norma and my study of movement uh, that also brought back to uh, back the, that. And other, I've had other mentors in that way. I mean, Etheridge Knight was a master of the oral tradition and also very much just had a very natural sense of the cadence and the rhythm of things. And I learned so much from him and I went to so many readings that he gave. And another person that was a teacher in this was my friend, uh, Paolo Canil, who was a, a musician, poet, a therapist, and um, a Swiss man who just died this in the last couple of weeks. And he and I did a lot of performing together. And this is another thing, the performance aspect of poetry, like uh, Lovers in the Free Fall. That also, um, you know, was is really part of my where I grow as a as an artist okay, yep. yeah. oh my well, internet's unstable yeah you're okay just let's just keep going through if you freeze you might have to log on again there you go you're back um so okay so my question now has to do with um when you read your poems, there are melodies and there's songs and the way you read them. Um, do people miss out on that? They buy your book. Um, mm -hmm. How do you, uh, do you feel that people 
may miss out on your performance aspect of your riding or does your stuff stand alone in your opinion? Well, I think there's so many so many dimensions to a poet. You know, I like the po I like the story aspect. I love the little uh, haikus that you, where you count the syllables. You know, I like the kind of strict forms and all of those things. Sometimes, you know, they yes, they they live on the on the page, but maybe they don't breathe as well on the page. You know, I think it's great. You know, we. I think it's a wonderful thing to um, to be able to hear a poem, but also to participate in the quiet kind of connection between a poet and a reader. And I'm also a very big journal keeper. I love drawing, I love colors, I love shapes. So I'm like, all of those things have really have, have informed me as an artist. And that was hard in the beginning because people were very strict about, you know, if you do visual art, it's over here. And if you do songs, it's over here. Or you don't belong here because you do these weird things or, you know. But now I think <laughs> times have changed. And I'm so, uh, so interested in the whole young cadre of, of uh, poets coming in with so many different voices and diversities of culture. And I think like, yeah, that's our momentum now. Well, you talked about the range of your work and how it can be interpreted in many, many different ways. What about how you present it? You're a very creative person. Do you read the same way each time? Do you actually mark in your book where your reflections are or where the no. pulse is in the story? Or might you read them differently every time? I think I read them differently every time. I do. But that, for instance, I think a very good study is that uh, Lovers in the Free Fall. Because I have a friend, she's a dancer, and she's actually an elder dancer too. And she's part of this group called Text Moves. And, you know, she wants to dance this poem with her ensemble. And so the last time we were on a Zoom, we did that poem, Lovers in the Free Fall, three different times, uh, three different you know, readings. And I think with each reading, sometimes I like to read quiet, you know, but when I come to that earth thing where I am plunging through the, you know, plunging through space uh, in the, the plausible earth, you know, somehow I just burst into the sound of it. You know, I can't help it. That's the way I do it. It's just, it's embodiment maybe. That's the, that's, I think that's the word that, my poems, um, the poems that, uh, you know, that I am connected to are really a part of my body, you know, and not just up here, but, you know, in all different places in my body. Well, some of your other poems, someone noted that your poem that was about politics was simply beautiful. Do you write many political poems? I do, yeah. Uh, because I don't uh, make that connection. I don't make a disassociation between uh, the political and the personal, but I try not to make them too rhetorical. You know, I try to uh, just like go, you, we can't escape what we're feeling now. And what we're feeling has to do with us as these little tiny entities, but also what is happening out there in the world. So there's, for me, there's always that um, infusion and influence of both. Now, do people close themselves off for both? For example, uh, your work is, you use a lot of rhymes. And I've heard poets yes. say, like, I don't like rhyming poems, or uh, people that say, I don't understand poems that don't rhyme. Um, <laughs> That's right. I know. Or, or before you even start, they say, I don't understand poetry. I just don't understand. But they do. You know, so that, yeah, they do, because it goes in somewhere. I mean, if they like the poem, if there's some kind of resonance, if there's some kind of connection, yes. There, well, here's a little haiku that maybe helps with that. Who is me and who is thee? And so what? And so that's it? Poetry? <laughs> who is me and who is thee? And so what? And so that's it? Poetry. So, yeah, I think it's like... Um, even starting with the uh, 
with the with our youngest youngest poets and again for me in my development i have i've done a lot of work with children over the years i was in the pilot program in the boston public schools and honestly i still get so much inspiration from what these kids say and it was it was so so much of a learning to to be at that time in the early 70s in circles of children and teachers and interaction, learning from each other. And uh, that's where I was raised up in this poetry. So I have a lot to thank the kids for too. Well, they mm -hmm. say children are born and they're innocent and they, they only know joy when they're born and people have to teach them hate. What about children and poetry? Are children, do you feel children are born with poetry or you gotta teach them poetry? Uh, I think they're born with poetry. I do. Um, what even if it's like one line, like looking up at the moon and saying, "Mommy, mommy, look! There's a there's a fingernail in the sky." You know, like yeah. I think things like little songs. I know my daughter just sang away at that time, and uh, I think the singing, listening to stories, uh, the whole oral thing with poetry, and I. Um, I've seen that uh, with children. Yeah, I think we get educated out of our poetry. I know I did. I mean, as you go in, you just get smaller and smaller, you know, into this tiny, tiny little box and somehow you have to burst out. Um, so I've found, you know, that kids, they, they can talk about the hardest things, honestly. So you have, you talk about these tiny little boxes you get educated into, which is great. Now, you're, a, you're well studied in expressive therapy and expressive arts therapy, which is, yeah. you have people in boxes and you break them out. Uh, tell me a little bit about expressive arts therapy. Well, expressive arts therapy is an international movement now. And it's actually, um, you know, first of all, it's, well, they call, they use this word, it's intermodal. All that means is that we're using all the different art forms and even uh, your politics and uh, all of these things to, um, to help to name the things that you know you know. And also for community building to, you know, that poetry can inspire and help uh, people to, um, to, help to create community all over the world. And there's so many different languages at work. And sometimes we have to just step aside and listen to the languages, you know, that are at work. And I, I have used with people who don't speak my language in these circles, things like um, doing uh, drawings, you know, and then translating them into language and then maybe translating that crossing another bridge and using movement and sound. And uh, it's a way of bringing people together, you know, into a common language. And I think there's many things that we understand. Um, it's not like we can create peace, but we can help um, to name the conflicts, you know, within the body and also uh, around the world. And we have, I mean, expressive arts isn't huge, but there's, we have different th uh, now uh, different circles of people in India and in um, Asia, Chi uh, Hong Kong, China, and then Canada. And uh, they're also very interested right now in, um, you know, finding more out about what languages, um, you know, we were sort of well, the colonizing, the, you know, taking, the taking of others' languages. How can we listen to one another without doing that? Or not to adopt, for instance, a Eurocentric attitude towards poetry. Just like that wonderful poet that you had a few weeks back, you know, from Nepal. There was so much to listen to yes, him and the fact that he was a priest. And I don't know, it was so fascinating uh, to hear him. So... I think a lot of this poetry is trying to listen to one another. So la last question of the night. Okay. Um, you've written for a long time and you've been a serious writer for a long time. Tell me what your hopes and dreams in a perfect world for poetry would be. Uh, 
I've stumped her. <laughs> well, it's such a big question. It's such a big question. Well, you know, I think it's a question that it's just like the bad things, like the virus, that poetry will find its way. You know, this emergence that we find poetry when we need it. And right now we need it in all the different ways, you know, and uh, try it also, I think it can help us to connect and to associate rather than to disassociate, which um, so many people are doing. And there's so much uh, mental health, uh, you know, uh, dangers out there in the world that I think that poetry is a way uh, of uh, coming, of helping, helping to create community through empathy and compassion and feeling. So I guess that I just hope that we keep on keeping on, all of us in our own special ways. There's no one way to do it. Well, I would, would like to thank you very, very much. And uh, that was such an interesting, that was such a great q and It just felt like we were just having a wonderful conversation. Well, you ask good questions there. Well, I get a lot of help from the, these folks yeah. that feeding, me, feeding me questions. Yeah. But anyway, uh, folks, uh, if you're watching on Facebook, here is the book, and it is simply wonderful. Um, so go pick it up at your favorite indie bookstore. Elis, do you have a favorite indie bookstore that people can order online? Um, well, let's see. I love the Grolier there. Uh, is in uh, Cambridge yeah. and... Um, the Booksmith and Brookline's good. Uh, I like all the bookstores. I, in fact, it, you know, um, oh, the Porter Square Books is good. Salem, what is the bookstore there that's in the North Shore? I don't know. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> anyway, check it out. Um, oh, uh, this is another little thing, Tim, about the book. Okay. If anyone's interested, <clears throat> uh, the book is $15. And if you, um, for $20, <laughs> I will um, sign and design a little page for you on the book and send it to, you know, send it to you personally. Um, so is that okay? Can I say yeah, my address and everything? Why don't, okay. you, why don't you give out your email address and people can contact you that way. Okay, that's it. So my email address is egmccam at yahoo.com. And I will answer because it's fun for me actually to, to do that, uh, put those. And I'll, I'll take it to the post office and mail it to you. That's E.G. McKim. You can look at her screen name. That's how you spell McKim, folks, at yahoo.com. And contact <laughs> me. And if you forget that, just contact me if you know me and I'll track down Liz. So yeah, gonna, even message I can uh, deal with, whatever. So I'm going to say Facebook. goodbye to all my Facebook friends and uh, that are watching in the stream through Facebook. If you guys wanted to be involved more in the Q&A, uh, just use the Zoom link the next time, and then you can also read on the open mic. And it's still not too late to use the Zoom link to participate in the open mic. So thank you all for oh. watching, and uh, see you soon.